two new minerals have been found inside a huge meteorite. A team of scientists has discovered two new minerals in a meteorite found in 2020 in Somalia, Alaliite and Elkenstantanite. The discovered minerals do not occur naturally on Earth, but similar ones have been created artificially in laboratories. The discoveries were made using a single 70-gram meteorite sample. But the entire meteorite is 2 meters wide and weighs 15 tons, so it's entirely possible that the space rock has more to offer. In 2020, a huge meteorite was found in Somalia, the ninth largest ever found. The meteorite was named El Ali after the nearby town of the same name. Although local camel herders say the rock has been known to them for generations and is called Nightfall. Inside the meteorite, scientists found two new minerals, Alaliite and Elkenstantanite. The first got its name from the meteorite itself. The second mineral is named after Professor Linda Elkins Tanton of Arizona State University. Principal investigator on NASA's Psyche mission to study a large, metal-rich asteroid. The description and results of the study of the meteorite samples were presented at the Space Exploration Symposium organized by the University of Alberta. The two minerals found came from a single 70-gram piece that was sent to the University of Alberta for classification. Researchers also found a potentially third unknown mineral. Chris Hurd, a meteorite researcher at the University of Alberta, said if scientists could get more samples from the massive meteorite, there's a chance that even more interesting minerals could be found. In collaboration with scientists at the University of California, Los Angeles and the California Institute of Technology, Heard classified the El Ali meteorite as an IAB iron meteorite, one of more than 350 in this category. The meteorite is almost 90% iron and nickel and is among the largest ever found. While Heard was analyzing the meteorite, he saw something that caught his attention. As he admitted, on the first day of analysis, his colleague Andrew Lowcock said, you have at least two new minerals there. It was phenomenal. In most cases, finding that a new mineral has emerged requires a lot more work, Heard said. Lowcock's quick identification was possible because the two minerals had previously been synthetically created in the 1980s. So he was able to match the composition of the newly discovered natural minerals with their man-made counterparts. Scientists continue to study the space rock to determine what it can tell us about the conditions during meteorite formation. How to determine the geological processes and geological history of the asteroid of which this rock was once a part. This is my field. But I never thought I'd be involved in characterizing completely new minerals just by working on a meteorite, Heard emphasized. Heard also noted that any new mineral discoveries could lead to exciting new applications. Every time we learn about a new material, materials scientists are also interested in its potential applications, Heard pointed out. It is currently unknown whether scientists will be able to obtain more samples for testing. Heard said his team got word that the meteorite had been moved to China in search of a potential buyer. The leprosy-causing bacteria may be the key to liver regeneration. Bacteria and viruses that were responsible for the greatest plagues and plagues in the history of mankind have a rather negative connotation. Meanwhile, some of them may be used in new therapies. It turns out that the bacteria that cause leprosy, reprogram, the liver cells, increasing its ability to grow and regenerate. At least in battleships. This discovery could lead to the development of new treatments. Researchers at the University of Edinburgh have discovered that the leprosy-causing bacteria are able to reprogram liver cells. 
leading to the organ's growth and rejuvenation. Such a process has been observed in armadillos. Importantly, the action of these dangerous bacteria did not cause any disease changes in the animals. These findings suggest that this process could be adapted to regenerate and heal human livers. The description and results of the research were published in the journal, Cell Reports Medicine. In some situations, the only salvation for people in the last stages of cirrhosis may be surgery and transplantation. So any alternative is worth its weight in gold here. Bacteria can help us, which we would rather not expect, because it is about leprosy. As the researchers point out, the microbes associated with leprosy can somehow reprogram cells contributing to the reconstruction of the liver in animals without exposing it to damage. In order to investigate this issue in more detail, the scientists decided to conduct an experiment using the leprosy-causing bacterium, Mycobacterium leprae. These studies were conducted with the assistance of the U.S. Department of Health. In order to conduct the experiment, 57 armadillos were infected with microbes, which in the natural environment are often carriers of the leprosy bacteria. Their livers were then examined and compared with the corresponding organs in healthy armadillos and those that proved resistant to infection. The comparison in each case was in favor of the infected armadillos. It turned out that their livers had enlarged, but in no case did this mean that they had been affected by any disease. All their elements, including blood vessels and bile ducts, were healthy and functioning properly. Researchers believe that the bacteria somehow managed to modify the regenerative capacity of armadillo livers and thus cause them to increase in size. But it doesn't end there. Some of the beneficial effects of bacteria on liver cells are even more remarkable. It turns out that they can also affect the most important cells of this organ, i.e. hepatocytes. Clearly, rejuvenating them. Surprisingly, the infected armadillos modified their gene expression patterns to become more similar to those of young animals. In their case, the genes associated with cell growth and multiplication were active, while the activity of those responsible for their aging was reduced. Here again, the researchers believe that the bacteria managed to reprogram the cells so as to revert him to the precursor cell stage, from which new hepatocytes could then develop. These observations may turn out to be extremely important from the point of view of medicine. If we could discover exactly how bacteria are able to renew liver cells, and then use this knowledge, it could significantly contribute to increasing the possibilities of treating this organ. In the event of an earthquake, rats will save us. You can find yourself under the rubble of buildings in various situations, be it as a result of a construction disaster, an earthquake or even warfare. Finding people trapped in this way is not easy. Rats, properly prepared for this role, may soon come to the aid of the survivors. Natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods and hurricanes can be extremely destructive and pose a great threat to people in the affected areas. A group of scientists came up with an idea how to effectively help the people who survived the disaster who found themselves under the rubble. In a project led by the Belgian organization APOPO, rats are being trained to help rescuers search for survivors among the rubble in disaster zones. The basic problem in the context of the possibility of quickly locating people trapped under collapsed buildings is the small amount of space, too small to fit a person or even a dog. In this situation, we would therefore need an even smaller ally, who also manages well and quickly orients himself in tight spaces. These unexpected allies turn out to be rats. 
These clever rodents need specialized training to become really good rescuers. They are properly prepared for this role by the Belgian non-profit organization APOPO. This organization can already boast of many successes in similar fields. In his base in Tanzania, he has been training both rats and dogs for 10 years. The purpose of these trainings is to prepare animals, for example, to search for mines. However, the program does not involve typical rats, but giant African rats. This is due to the fact that they are able to survive in captivity twice as long, about eight years. In the case of rats adapted for exploration missions, they participate in 15-minute training sessions five days a week. It is estimated that it will take 9 to 12 months to fully train one rat. Currently, rats are trained in a simulated environment to reach a person in a specific location, activate a switch on their vest, which in turn turns on the signal, and then return to the base where they wait for not a reward. However, the entire project would not have a chance to be implemented without appropriate technological support. APOPO's cooperation with the Eindhoven University of Technology is key here. The rats were equipped with appropriate backpacks. Their prototype, created a few years ago by engineer Sander Verdiesen, consists of a container printed on a 3D printer in which there is a camera that transmits the image in real time and at the same time records the recording on the SD card. The whole thing was mounted on a neoprene vest. The rats felt quite uncomfortable at first, but they got used to the burden they were carrying quite quickly. However, engineers will face several challenges. First of all, it will be necessary to reduce the size and weight of the backpack. In the current version, the whole thing weighs about 140 grams, which is twice as much as originally planned. A much more urgent problem, however, is the reduction, and specifically the lowering, of the container. The current one causes some problems for the rats, because they suddenly realize that they are unable to pass in places that would not normally cause them any problems. At the same time, the engineer's ambition is to add, for example, a two-way microphone to the camera. So if in the near future we find ourselves in the situation mentioned at the beginning, let's look for a rat with an unusual backpack. In Sydney, there is a war over trash cans between humans and cockatoos. Residents of South Sydney, Australia, have been fighting a real battle over garbage for a long time. Their enemy is not typical, because they are cockatoos. It started with a few curious birds learning how to open garbage cans. Other cockatoos picked up on the trick, and the behavior quickly spread to other neighborhoods in the city. Meanwhile, people try to make it difficult for them in various ways. The case became so serious that it interested scientists. Yellow-crested or golden-crested cockatoos, Cacatua gallerita, are the indigenous inhabitants of these areas. They are noisy birds that have fully adapted to the urban environment. They quench their thirst in public fountains and search the streets for food. They are considered a nuisance pest by Sydney residents. They eat the crops and keep you awake at night with their ear-splitting squeaks. They're also insanely smart. Some of the individuals have developed an ingenious technique of opening the lid of garbage cans to scour the waste for tasty table scraps. Scientists had previously noticed that this phenomenon had spread to different districts of the city. This ability has become so common among the Sydney cockatoos that scientists believe that the parrots imitate the actions of their fellows and learn from each other. However, the people of Sydney also use ingenious tricks and ways to stop them. 
cockatoos, on the other hand, respond according to the situation, often thwarting human attempts to defend themselves. This peculiar, arms race, between birds and humans caught the attention of scientists who detailed the techniques used by both humans and parrots in current biology. When I first saw the video of cockatoos opening baskets, I thought it was an interesting and unique behavior. Even then, I knew we had to look into it, says lead author Barbara Klum a behavioral ecologist at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. Cockatoos are motivated by food waste. Parrots really like bread. When one finds an open basket, all the cockatoos nearby will come and try to get something good to eat, explains Klum. Birds usually pry open the lid of the baskets with their beaks, then maneuver and turn the lid over. This is important for the entire community of these birds. We could actually show that it's a cultural trait, says Plum. Cockatoos learn behavior from observing other individuals. And each group has its own special technique. So over a wide geographic range, the techniques become less and less similar to each other, explains the researcher. A survey of scientists found that to keep cockatoos at bay, people place bricks and stones on the lids of their bins, tie water bottles to the top of their containers, tie ropes to prevent the lid from turning, use sticks to lock the hinges, and when parrots figure out the security, then people are forced to change it to something else. There are even special container locks available for sale, says Klump. In this situation, not only cockatoos learn new social behavior. So do people who come up with new methods of protection on their own. Many people actually learn similar methods from their neighbors or people on their street. So they get inspiration from someone else, explains Klum. Currently, the most effective tactic which has not yet been figured out by birds, is to wedge a stick. A pair of shoes or something else between the hinges and the basket to block the lid from opening. The bricks seem to work for a while. But the cockatoos quickly figured out how to defeat this protection. They got too smart. Neighbors across the highway suggested sticks to block the hinge. So far, the method is working says one Sydney resident. According to him, a brick or other weight permanently attached to the lid of the trash can also work. As quickly as humans come up with new ways to stop cockatoos from opening their containers, birds come up with ways to defeat them. According to Klum, this is a classic example of an arms race in cultural evolution. People who were frustrated with throwing garbage on the street began to adapt to the situation. But then the cockatoos did the same. The researcher is reluctant to say who will win this litter battle, but she and her colleagues plan to look at how cockatoo behavior changes from season to season. Klump expects to see more of this kind of interaction between humans and animals in the future. As cities grow, we will have more interaction with wild animals. I hope that our understanding and tolerance for the animals with whom we share our lives will improve, the researcher concludes.